Greetings, comrades! You know, there's only one popular symbol of modern Russia on the internet that makes me cringe. When someone hears about Russia, he immediately begins this eternal list. Oh, Russia, Putin, Bez, Vodka, Matryoshka, Babushka, Balalaika, and that's fine, fine. But when they start adding Adidas, Sunflower Seeds, Hard Bass, and Gopniks to that list, I start getting angry. Why, yes, I don't really like my country being associated with semi literate street thugs and tracksuits. But now, in the year 2023, I am especially pleased to be able to declare that the Gopnik subculture is finally dead. Oh, stop. First of all, it's worth clarifying that Gopniks are not a real subculture. They do not have any unifying moral values, ideas or philosophy or goals, and Gopniks don't call themselves that. Ask a goth if he is a goth. He'll proudly answer that, yes, he is. Ask a Gopnik the same thing and it will definitely come to blows. On the contrary, they prefer to call themselves normal guys, real guys, true guys, proper guys, you get the idea. Even the style of their clothing, despite the stereotypes, could be different. Usually it was just cheap stuff from the nearest market. So who is a Gopnik? A young man of low social status, usually from dysfunctional families. He recognizes the right of the strongest, tries to live by some unwritten rules similar to the laws of the criminal world, and is characterized by increased intolerance and aggression toward everyone around him. Today let's talk about how the Soviet Union had real, traditional Gopniks, how this movement was reborn after the collapse of the USSR and gave birth to the image of a dude in an Adidas suit with a shaved head, which has become one of the biggest memes about Russia, and lastly, about how this movement finally died, and what came to replace it. So, I have already said that one of the things that unites the Gopniks is their low social status. The word Gopnik itself emerged before the revolution of 1917, when there were special organizations in Russia that took care of the poor, the crippled, the sick, the orphaned, etc. There was not much money allocated to help these young people, so they were forced to engage in illegal street activities – theft, robbery, begging. The word Gopnik comes from the acronym GOP, the name of one of these organizations, which stands for Gradskoye Obshtvo Prizrenie, City Welfare Society, or State Dormitory of the Proletariat, as it was called after the revolution. It was located in St. Petersburg on Ligovsky Prospect, and this place can rightly be called the birthplace of this phenomenon, which then spread throughout the country. Gradually, the word Gopnik began to be used to refer to all St. Petersburg tramps, ragamuffins and beggars, not just the inhabitants of the building in question. The state dormitory of the proletariat was closed in 1926, but the word itself has remained in the history of not only the Russian language, but has become practically international. For the time being, the authorities did not pay much attention to Gopniks. They did not interact with crime bosses and were engaged only in petty vandalism, fights against each other between different neighborhoods and finding out which of the gangs was cooler. In the Soviet Union until the 1980s, they were more commonly referred to as hooligans. Under that name they lived on the page of satirical magazines like Krokodil and Pepe. In fact, it was not until the end of the Soviet Union's life cycle that these gangs became a big problem. This was largely because really big ones began to emerge, no longer interested in petty hooliganism, but in more serious criminal matters. From the 1970s through the 1990s, dozens of teenage communities emerged in the USSR, clashing with one another over the control of their territories in cities and towns across the country. Street gangs in the late USSR and early Russia were characterized by a rigid hierarchy, strict division of roles, mandatory membership fees, collecting tribute, a common monetary fund, abshak, protection of territory, group fights, intolerance towards informal groups, sexism, and a ban on alcohol and drug use by their members. Yes, technically those who were known as Gopniks in the USSR did not consume alcohol at all. 
However, this particular rule was often ignored by ordinary street gang members. The backbone of these street gangs were usually young men aged 14 to 19, and the upper limit was quite rigid, because after a certain age most people from these groups were conscripted into the army, and after two years in the army to return to such an environment was no longer considered cool. The word Gopniks resurfaced then as an outwardly negative designation for members of these groups. It was, of course, not used by the gang members themselves. What happened in the 90s? By and large, everything is obvious. The explosive growth of organized crime in connection with the sharply deteriorating economic situation. All the same division into our and their territories, which entertained the marginal youth in the 80s, only on a national scale, and instead of sticks and kicks, assault rifles and grenades. Many members of youth hooligan groups have now become members of real OCGs. Were they still called Gopniks? No. To put it very simply, the young people who were attracted to the underworld were now divided into two halves. One half went higher in this hierarchy. They no longer cared about petty squabbles in the courtyards of Brezhnevkas, they were interested in protection racket of some large factory or market. And the other half remained as a kind of parody of their older brothers. They tried to imitate the criminal world in everything, in clothing, lifestyle, speech, behavior. But they did not actually cross the line that kept them from committing serious crimes. They were engaged in petty theft, extortion, robbery or beating up random passersby, rather than in any serious criminal activity. At best, they were the most low-ranking members of organized crime gangs. It was this category that came to be called Gopniks in the classic sense of the word. Young people from disadvantaged neighborhoods spending their evenings on the streets in the search of a loch, a person at the expense of whom you can assert your dominance, scare and humiliate him, and maybe get some material gain from this if possible. Well, at the very least you can take away his fancy jacket. Naturally, such an image of this subculture could not look positive in the eyes of other people. This is why gradually the word Gopnik itself began to be used not only to describe these real guys in sports pants, but also as a very broad negative definition of aggressive, poorly educated, unsophisticated people without any moral values or inspirations who self-assert themselves through humiliation and violence against others. It is logical that this stratum itself could not exist for long in an unchanged form, so in fact it lived only for 15 to 20 years. And by the early 2010s, actual Gopniks could be found only in the most depressing neighborhoods of the most remote cities in Russia. But they did manage to leave their mark on history. The peak of interest and popularity of Gopniks in the Russian-speaking world was at the time when the subculture itself was already dying out, somewhere around 2008-2009. It was a kind of a society's reflection on its recent past. Look what we had not so long ago, it's a good thing we don't have that anymore. Oh, and remember how a few years ago you could walk into any alley and hear questions like What neighborhood are you from? Why so cocky? Got a cell phone? No? What if I find one on you? Haha! <laughs> <laughs> Their images have been ironically exploited in photo shoots and music videos. Designer Gosha Rubchinsky has built his entire career on these very images. In 2010, that iconic music video was also released, which forever connected Gopniks to Adidas and Harbass. Yeah, let me tell you a big secret. Real Gopniks don't listen to Harbass and never have. They listen to either Russian chanson or blatniak, or primitive pop and rap. In Russia, even the ironic interest in them disappeared quickly enough, but on the English-speaking internet, it was just the beginning. This meme in the form of Slav Squatting began to gain popularity in 2013, when large communities appeared on Facebook, posts on Reddit and meme compilations on YouTube. It was then that the canonical image of the Gopnik as a meme was formed from the combination of photos and videos that had been made several years before on the Russian internet. A squatting young man wearing a cap and an Adidas tracksuit with the obligatory three strides, eating sunflower seeds, smoking and drinking alcohol from the bottle. Either a Russian or a Pole. If a Gopnik isn't squatting, he's dancing to hard bars. The term Gopnik itself has not become mega popular, instead the phrase squatting Slav is more common. 
Look at Google Trends regarding matches of these terms in English and in Russian. The difference in peak values is 5 to 6 years. That is, if usually the Russian part of the internet picked up some memes after its big brother with a delay. Here it is exactly the opposite. The culture of squatting sloths peaked in 2016 to 2017, when many videos and channels that exploit this image appeared on YouTube. All with the same hard bars and other attributes of Russia and Eastern Europe. Bear, Sushankas and Vodka. Some even believe that the popularity of this meme is directly related to the migration crisis in Europe in the same years, and the surge of right-wing and nationalist sentiment in the EU countries and the United States. The image of a tough, squatting Slav seemed like a good answer for the influx of the refugees from Asia and Africa, but we will not delve into such conspiracy theories. Since the summer of 2018, the trend for Gopniks and squatting Slavs has subsided, but in fact, Gopniks are still the main meme and stereotype about Eastern Europeans, even replacing the traditional Hollywood cranberry stereotypes about Russians with their AK-47s, vodka bears and balalaikas. By the way, to some extent these memes are not very politically correct, and some might even call them discriminatory against Eastern Europeans. After all, in fact, equating all Eastern Europeans with Gopniks is about the same as equating all black Americans with the street thugs from the criminal hoods of Los Angeles and Chicago. But in fact, no one is particularly offended by these memes. Self-irony has always been intrinsic to Russians and Poles alike. But let us return from the world of memes to the real people that exist on the streets of all Russian cities. I've claimed that the culture itself is dead. Where did it go? First of all, it is worth remembering that the original Gopniks are first and foremost the children of the 1990s, when people from disadvantaged neighborhoods simply didn't have many options for making money. It was either crime or… nothing. I understand that there's a popular opinion on the internet that literally everything in Russia is about to end and there will be starving people roaming the streets and eating each other, but that's not true. Now the standard of living, even in remote and depressed cities, is much higher than it was 20-25 years ago, when in fact every walk on the street in the evening could turn into your last one. The old Gopniks either went to jail, went to the next world because of their not-so-healthy lifestyle, or miraculously grew up and wised up. And young people were no longer so interested in this kind of street life. Secondly, oddly enough, I'm pretty sure it was computer games that helped. Imagine, you're not the richest teenager from the late 90s. What do you do in the evenings? There is no work in your town, there is no interest in accessible leisure time either. You go to the bench in front of your Khrushchevka for a beer with your friends, and there you might find some loser and have fun. Now moving forward 20 years, you're exactly the same teenager, what do you do in the evenings? Yes, you have a CSGO match and all your friends are on Discord. What bench? Why take away someone's smartphone? You can assert your dominance just by winning the next round. The Gopnik generation was raised by the street, and the next generation was raised by PCs and cell phones. Thirdly, the laws and control are getting stricter. If we're talking about Moscow, literally every alleyway is full of cameras. If you just think about stealing that dude's cell phone, they'll find you on cameras before you even get to the nearest subway station. There are also more police in Russia nowadays, and in this case, that is a plus. People hardly carry cash anymore and there are fewer people willing to risk going to jail for 5 years for like $50. Plus, there are a lot of new ways for young people to earn money, even from poorer families. In the past they kinda had to sing to petty theft, but now they can easily go and work as a courier or a salesman in a cell phone store. The Gopnik of 2023 is most often just a poorly dressed man who disturbs the public peace. It is a man who comes to the beach drunk and cries loudly to the chanson throwing beer bottles around him or just tries to have a conflict in the subway with someone, but without much violence. No longer a terrifying being, but rather a pathetic one, not feared, but simply avoided. However, nothing goes away without a trace. After all, young people can still gather around some idea, some image. If we talk about any specific movements among young people that can somehow be called the heirs of Gopniks, I can think of three such movements in the last 10 years. The first is the Auye movement, which translates as something like prisoners' criminal unity. 
I cannot say that it is any kind of formalized society at all. Rather, it was a generic name for teenagers who were still attracted to the criminal lifestyle and the related laws and concepts of the underworld. In fact, they were simply scattered communities of marginalized youths who copied some attributes of real criminal gangs and tried to live by their laws. Nevertheless, in Russia in 2020, the Supreme Court of the Russian Federation recognized AUYE as an extremist organization and banned its activities in the country. Although, again, according to many experts, there is no single organization with this name. Secondly, there are football fans, the so-called Ofniki. It is just another kind of teenage copycats, but if the Aouye fans cosplayed the world of thieves, then the young football fans cosplayed the European fan groups with their mass fights. In general, that was usually all they were interested in. They weren't interested in football itself, but fighting in the nearby woods with their peers from the neighboring school? Hell yeah! Oh yeah, you also have to wear the right clothing, preferably Stone Island. If you wear Stone Island and can't explain why you are wearing it, prepare to get punched in the face. Basically, they're just small gangs of teenagers wandering the streets and shopping malls, looking for peers to get their hands on. Again, they don't really want to rob anyone, it's more important for them to find a victim, get into a fight and prove themselves. Perhaps it is this subculture that can be considered the closest to the gothics of the 90s and 2000s, except that they have less of a mercenary motive. And then there is a third subculture, which for a few days caused a real furor on Russian TV this year. It's weeps. Ooh. Yeah, I'm not kidding. In February of this year, in the Aviapark Mall in Moscow, there was a fight between Ofniks and Weeps, from which the latter suddenly emerged victorious. And these anime people were dressed very unusually, in hoodies with the number 4 on a white spider, taken from the Hunter x Hunter series. A day later, the fights were repeated, already in other places. As a result, all the major Russian media broke the story of a dangerous new subculture called PMC Rodan, who allegedly gather in shopping malls, attacking migrants and football fans and provoking mass fights. Roskomnadzor promptly blocked the largest VK group with this name. Even Kremlin spokesman Dmitry Peskov was forced to give his response about some dangerous new subculture that is spoiling our youth. Except, in fact, it was just a group of weaves with long black hair wearing the same merch that suddenly managed to beat up a group of Ofniks which attacked them. And in just a few days, the media was able to mold them into a dangerous subculture, literally Gopniks to zero. Only not in tracksuits, but in anime hoodies. Thank god they were not in made costumes. That is all for today, and as always, a huge shout out to my biggest patrons. Stake 221, Steven, Elizabeth Zaharova, Kirill Klimuk, Zimon Berze, and Jordan Lamotte. Thank you guys for your support. 